isn't it, where you, you read a hard psalm, with lots of things that are difficult, uh, that seem to jar with us and, our, um, and how we feel about life often, uh, yet still we're, we're encouraged to say thanks be to God. Uh, we're going to see, hopefully, why this is a psalm to say thanks for uh, this morning. Um, I'm just going to move this Bible like normal, um, and then I'll pray, and then we'll stop. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we love you. Uh, you are our God. And we want to come before you now with our hearts open, asking you to help us understand this psalm, help us understand where it's pointing, help us understand why it's here and why we need it. Uh, give us grace, help me to explain it. And uh, we pray we, would, I pray we would understand you better and love you more as a result of this. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start with a few stories, if that's okay. I'm going to start with the story of Moses, who's a man from North Korea. He, uh, he, North Korea is a, is a harsh country, as many of you know, so he, he didn't have much food. Um, so he left North Korea in, in the north to go to China to get some food and resources to bring back to his family. Um, as he'd, after he'd left, he, he, he stumbled across, he, he met in China some Christians who explained to him the message of Jesus Christ. He became a Christian and then was, and realized he was so overwhelmed by the need of his country to understand who Jesus was and follow him that he, um, he, wa- he wanted to go back to tell his, his country people, fellow countrymen, about Jesus. On his way back, he gets caught at the, at the um, a kind of the border and he gets thrown in jail in jail, he has to endure pretty harsh poverty, cramped cells, really difficult circumstances. He's starting to get ill. He's starting to, to, to lose his health. He's starting to go so thin and faint. And, and his um, fellow countrymen, these guards, are starting to uh, have, uh, beat him regularly because they think he's a spy of some form. How does Moses... How does he pray for those guards and the people who are mistreating him? I'll tell you the story of Corrie ten Boom. I think some of you have met Corrie ten Boom a little while ago. She, she went through harsh um, concentration camps. In 1947, after she'd come out, she was speaking in a church. And she says this, it was in a church in Munich when I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him, the balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, and the next, the blue uniform and the cap with its skull and crossbones came into her mind. She recognized this person as one of the guards in the concentration camp. Memories of the camp come back into her mind. Uh, All of the harsh things that she saw, having to walk naked past this man, completely vulnerable, memories of a sister who died there. Now the man is in front of her. How does she engage with that man? Now a man called David, he, um, he's been He's been brought from nowhere, not, not by his own. He's been, quite, kind of, he's been picked out as a guy who's going to be a great man in a country. And it's, um, so he's put in a high position, and he's succeeding. He's doing really well. He's, um, he's achieving great things. He's doing everything he's meant to do. Things like he's been giving blessing after blessing. And he makes great friends. But all these friends start to get really jealous of him and bitter towards him. And they start to turn on him. And they come after him. And they start to ruin his life. And in fact, they want to just kill him. How does he respond to those friends? Last week, we looked at the issue of suffering. The week before, we looked at the issue of how we can have refuge in God. This is a series where we're we're trying to learn a little bit more about how to pray. Because as Christians, we need to pray in order to survive. And we need to be able to pray, not just in the good times, but in the hard times. I doubt 
many of us will experience a sort of hardship that Moses, Corrie ten Boom, and maybe this, this guy David experience. But the less, but they are great test cases, if you like. That how they respond, we can learn a lot from. And because we're all going to learn, we're all going to go through times in our lives where we're treated badly, where we're treated badly being Christian, just treated badly generally, where people come against us, they accuse us, they do, want to do us wrong, they want to harm us. And we need to know how we should pray in those situations. And if I was to ask us all here, and you say, how should you pray for those people? I bet most people here would know the answer. Know the answer that Jesus has taught us because they know their Bibles well enough. Well, we should, we should pray for our enemies. That's what Jesus said. Pray for those who persecute you. But when you're faced with deep injustice and deep wrong and deep um, pain that you're suffering, sometimes though that verse just seems, can seem a little bit glib. How? How is it possible to pray for our enemies, the people who hate us, who want to ruin us? How is it possible to, to pray for the people who are, treat us unjustly and unfairly and give us a hard time and, and who never give us the time of day? David here, this man, is treated very unfairly, it seems. And he doesn't pray for mercy and forgiveness for his enemies. He prays the exact opposite. He prays for judgment and justice against his enemies. And what we need to see today, I think, is as we look through this psalm, is how is it possible that we, we are called to pray for mercy for our enemies, but David here, and in this psalm, which has been put intentionally into God's word for us, why, why does he not pray that? Why does he pray for justice and judgment? Why is this psalm here? And I hope we'll see two things today. The rightness of justice. That's the first thing. The rightness of justice and fair judgment. We can't get rid of that. And the second thing is how God punches through justice and judgment to bring mercy. That's how we can pray that prayer. The rightness of justice and how God punches through justice to bring mercy to people like us. So of those three stories I mentioned at the start, the third one was this guy in this psalm, King David. I've been watching a lot of films recently. Um, we've got a young baby. She's, he's up at night. I put my iPad in front of me and try to keep myself awake while I'm holding him sometimes. And I'm watching lots of films. Some of them have got spies in them. And you know the classic spy film? There's always often somebody, a spy, that um, kind of pretends goes into enemy territory or, or, or an enemy comes into home territory and they pretend to be best friends with somebody or even maybe a, a, in a, rela- a romantic relationship with somebody and they promise so much and they're, they're really pally and, and they deceive somebody into thinking they really care about them. And then there's always a moment when that, that person realizes and figures it out and they feel completely betrayed and it's like their heart is ripped out and they've been abused and used. David's experience that we, we, we learn about in the first, mainly in the first five verses and a few other verses later on is, is similar to that. He's been, he's been raised up. We don't exactly know when it happened in his life, but he's been raised up to be the, the king of God's people. And whether it's before he's properly put on a throne or after he's put on a the throne, there are lots of friends about him who are clearly very kind to him and loving to him. And he loves them, it says in verse 5, in verse 4. But in spite of his love for them, something has happened where these people he loves dearly have turned on him and are trying to destroy him. And he feels completely betrayed. He hasn't done anything wrong. They attack him without cause, it said in verse 3, yet they encircle him with words of hate. 
They are lying about him. They accuse him in return for his love. And they, even though he's doing good to them, they give him evil. This sort of treatment can mess people up, big style. When people are treated like this, sometimes when they, don't, they can lose sight of what's actually true and, true and right. And sometimes people can think when they're treated like this that actually they have done something wrong. And they're just guilty all the time because people treat them badly all the time. But David manages to hold his, hold his nerve. He manages to, to see clearly and he knows he's done nothing wrong. And so he sees how bad and how unjust and unfair the accusations that are coming at him are and the attempts to take him, the king of God's people, unfairly off his throne and destroy him. It's just wrong and the betrayal is so deep. And we, we can understand that sort of thing, can't we? We want justice here in our world Justice for the, the, the 96 Hillsborough fans, which was kind of wrapped up a, a year or two ago, who were, who were, who, you know, who were, who were said they were, uh, they were, you know, it was just an accident, but actually the, 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 the Liverpool fans wanted justice. They said, no, we, he's been, they've been unlawfully killed. And someone, needs to, and someone needs to be blamed. There needs to be fault, and there was fault. There was a cover-up. When we hear of, um, of an old person who was robbed and beaten for a small bit of money in the house, we cry out for the person to be found and put to justice, don't we? We can understand, naturally, David's feelings here. He has been treated awfully, and he wants justice. And so what he does... Verse 4, it says, but I give myself to, to prayer. He doesn't do the thing that we're tempted to do, which is to bring justice himself, to, to go up to these people and sort them out, you know, get the boys around. He prays. But what he prays is staggeringly harsh, it seems. He prays it in verses 6 all the way through to verse 19, 20. And I'm going to try, if I can sum up the contents of it, he prays for, prays this stuff for the people who've misabused him. He prays that they would die. He prays that they would lose their job. He prays that his, their, his, their family, his, their, the, the family of these guys would, would, would lose him so that there won't be any support or help. In verse 9. He prays that his family home will be taken from his family. He prays that a creditor, it says in verse 11, will come along and and strangers will come and take all of his his work and stuff he's worked for from him. He prays that no one will be kind to his family after he's gone. He prays that his name will be cut off so that no one will be called by his name. And in that generation, that that time of, that was a huge thing. He prays that the sin would be remembered before the Lord. And I think that's so that if anybody from his family prays, God won't hear them. He wants them gone. And you question, whoa, that is full on. That is harsh. This is in the Bible. This is God's king praying this. Is it fair? Well, in verse 15 and, well, 16, 17, he, he gives a little reason. He says, well, for, for, well here's why. The, this guy, the, these enemies, they didn't remember to show kindness. They pursued those who were poor and needy. They pursued the brokenhearted and he put them to death. They cursed. So David prays, let curses come upon him. Let him get what he deserves. David's praying, I want him to suffer. I want him to know what he's done. He deserves to be punished. And it's not because David is so self-entitled that he thinks he's so wonderful. It's because he's the king of God's people. 
And to accuse the king of God's people you, um, is, is a big deal. It's a bit more like treason than it is about a personal slight. But, I mean, these, these words, these are hard-hitting. What do they mean? What, how, do we, how do we process these? I want to say, that just before we move on, there is a lot to be learned from who he prays for to get this justice. Because he prays to God, because he prays to the living God and, and doesn't try to get justice himself, there's a kind of a, a reassurance there that he, he's expecting God to be fair and just to this person, completely fair and just. And that's a good thing for us to know that God is a fair and just God. If we, if we think of the things that we pray for, all, all the injustices we see in our lives, when we flick on the news like we have done over the last few years and seen ISIS um, repeatedly abuse innocent civilians and a lot of Christians and um, cause all sorts of turmoil and damage and distress. And to know that those, some of those, those soldiers have got away and they've not been caught by, uh, by, by kind of the allied forces, it's reassuring, isn't it, to know that there's a God who will judge fairly. It's really reassuring. See, I think we, we need judgment in our lives. We need to know that God is a fair judge and he's a just judge. And one day when he wraps up the world and his second coming, which we've been looking at, thinking about a bit in Advent, that is what he will do. And David has loads of confidence that that will happen. In verses 21 and 22, he, he prays, and, prays on the basis of God's goodness and, and, and for the glory of his name and reminds him that he, as one of God's people, is so poor and needy, but he prays and said, you know, I'm going through this. In verse 26, help me, Lord, save me. And then later on, at the end of the psalm, he knows. He knows he's going to end up praising God. He knows that God will stand there and support him. He has confidence that God will come through for him. And that is true for every injustice in the whole world. Justice will be paid in some way. And it will be completely fair. And we need a world where that happens because I don't think we can survive very well with, if we think that justice won't be done. It can rip up your, heart, your soul and your heart. If you're desperate to see justice and you don't know if it'll ever happen, it can ruin you. But we need to make the gap. We need to bridge the gap between this sort of prayer where you, we pray for justice and the prayer that Jesus calls us to pray where we pray for forgiveness. How is it that if justice is right and proper, we can pray for our enemies' prayers of love and blessing? If justice is so important, why do we not just pray this prayer? Is it because God has changed? Perhaps he's a different God now in the New Testament and the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament was harsh and mean. The God of the New Testament, though, where Jesus came, he was a loving God. Well, that, that can't be the case, can it? We, God can't change. Plus, there's so much stuff in the Old Testament that we love, that we use, that, we, that points towards Jesus. It, it seems to be treated as a, as a whole unity, all of the Bible, the same God throughout all of it. So that can't be the same. No, I think the reason is a, is a slightly different reason. It's that God is perfectly, it's more that, that God is perfectly just and perfectly right and perfectly righteous and so he will, will always needs justice to be done but he is not only just. He is not only righteous. He is also loving and merciful as well. And we see this even in the Old Testament. In the third commandment that God gives the third commandment, where he says, you shall not make a carved image or any likeness that is in heaven above to God, he's saying this to God's people, or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And then he says this. This is like a little picture of his character if you were to roll it out over time. This is how he reveals himself in the Old Testament. He says, I, I am a jealous God, and I visit the sin, the iniquity, of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. So he says, when there's sin, I will, I will bring, I will, I, will, I will visit it, I will judge it for three to four generations. But, that's for those people who hate God. 
But then he says, but I'm showing, I show steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So we've got four generations and we've got thousands of generations. Do you see how there is judgment in the Old Testament, but there's love. And over time, his love is greater and it wins. Now that's how God reveals it a little bit in the Old Testament. And we see it as well when we move to the New Testament. I talked before about the, the comings of Jesus we talked about the end, the sec- there's a second coming when Jesus will come and judge. But that's not the only coming of Jesus. We know that. We're, we're in Christmas time. We, we're singing songs about it all the time. The, uh, the second coming of Jesus is when he'll judge. But the first coming, the first coming of Jesus, this coming is where we see how God reveals his character and his love and his mercy. And I think we see it like this. You know, if you're in a, dis- it's pictured like this. You know, when you disagree with someone, look, which I'm sure you all do plenty of times. So I do this with my wife plenty and we, we have arguments and frustrations and we, I might wrong her, she might wrong me. I might be saying, but you've done this. And she'll be saying, no, but you've done that. And then you just go back and forward and there's, you're saying, but it's right that you, 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 you've done something wrong to me. So you need to understand that and realize that. And she's like, yeah, but it's right that you've done something wrong to me. And then you get... It just keeps going back and forwards and the way those sorts of relationships are resolved it's when somebody just says yeah yeah totally that's my fault when somebody when somebody takes upon themselves the blame and says yep that was me that's the only way those relationships can go forwards and at that point in those relationships The person who takes on the blame often is the person who's saying, I I value you more than this little tiny injustice that's going on. They value the person that they love more than the disagreement. And that principle, I think, is is a principle we see when Jesus comes at Christmas. In Psalm 109, God's king has been rejected and so it deserves ju- the, the people who reject him deserve judgment. At Christmas, we see God's king come. But because he cares about the person more than any injustice, he's, he's happy coming as a vulnerable, weak child who could be open to attack. He comes into darkness, you know, Darkness of night, but symbolic darkness of sin and mess and and all of the problems of the world. He comes right into the middle of that. Not as somebody strong, but as a weak baby. And those who who hear of him and hear of the prophecies, because he's the king, you'd go, surely the king should be recognized and honored. But, you know, we know where he was born. He was born in a stable the innkeeper shouldn't have said, oh yeah, I've got room in my stable. The innkeeper should have said, get out everybody from my house because the king is here to be born. Let's give him the best room. But he didn't. He was in a stable. He was treated poorly. That's an injustice against the king of kings who was born as a baby. But he cares about people more, so he allows it. Herod, the great king, comes to kill Jesus. But God doesn't strike him down there and then. He allows it, and then Jesus is taken off, protected. But suffering and injustice, why should the king leave his country? He grows up. He is homeless, ignored. That's an injustice. He's maligned by people, he's, he's a, like shouted down, he's abused, he's rejected by his family. Despite being a true son of Israel, that's an injustice. He has scoffed at and belittled, Jesus is. That's an injustice. All these things we read about happening to David, they seem to be true of Jesus as well. Jesus was treated like this. 
Jesus was abused. And Jesus is more of a king than David was. He's the true son of God. He's not just a king. He is God himself in the flesh, in front of people. People that he loves, but people who are abusing him. But he cares about people more than, than mere justice. So that he doesn't heap vengeance on them there and then, even though he could. Instead, he takes the injustice and is abused, and wicked people come against him, and accusers accuse him at a trial, even though he's completely innocent, not said a single word wrong for all of his life, this, this Christ child. He, he is sentenced to death, and he lies on a cross, and there we see the justice. But this time, it's not justice that, that the accusers, well, it is justice that the accusers deserve, but it's not heaped out on the accusers. It's heaped out on this king. See, this king goes further than King David. Jesus goes further. Jesus goes, I want justice. May all of this stuff happen to those who accuse me. But this time, he doesn't say, well, it just happened to them. He said, put it on me. I will take that injustice. Pour it on me. Let it soak into my body like water, like it says in verse 18, like oil into my bones. Let me take the curse that all of God's people deserve for rejecting the king. Let justice be done, but put on me. He was brutally murdered, this little Jesus, this little baby, innocent though he was. And here we see love and justice together. The, tr the, the most clear revelation of God's, what God is like. He loves justice, does God. He loves it. But he wants his people more. He loves them. And so he'll deal with the justice by dying in his son so that we don't have to face the justice that we deserve for rejecting the king. That is how God can burst through justice and bring love to us. Often we think of justice and say that justice is like in one hand here, say, and love would be here. And we think when, when God forgives, he just, go, he just kind of forgets about justice. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. I'll forgive them. He can't. He's perfect. He has to deal with justice. So what he does is he punches through justice by dying on a cross. He, gets, he deals with it. He pays the price we deserve for us so he can bring us into his kingdom and only being blessing rather than judgment. Jonathan Edwards, a great, a great theologian from a long time ago, said this about how God is glorified. He says, God is glorified by his justice, but he's glorified more by bringing mercy. If God was to simply judge all of the sin in the world... It would be, he would be glorified. It would bring him glory. It would be right and proper and good. But God wants to give more to his people. He wants his people. And so he gives them mercy and justice through judgment. And so what does that mean for us as we end? Well, it means very simple. It, that's how we can pray the prayer. We can pray for our enemies. We can bless those who curse us. Because... All cursing deserves to be paid, but all of our cursing against God, all of our, our rejection of him, all of the wrong we've done has been paid, but not by us. Justice has been done. And so we can reflect God and his character. When, when people wrong us and people rub up against us, we can say, I forgive you because I've been forgiven by God. We know justice has been paid because God has forgiven us all of the, just, the injustices against him. We're coming up to Christmas. How much do, do families rub up against each other at Christmas? How much are there these little slights and these wrongs? Well, this Christmas, you can, you can reflect God by forgiving rather than holding grudges. You can reflect God by giving mercy rather than thinking, no, they, des they deserve to know how, how they mistreated me. You can love them. Because Jesus has, that's what Jesus does. He deals with justice so he can love. And you can reflect God's character there.
there are all sorts of situations in our life where we will be wronged. And when you're crying out and you're going, I want justice, remember, God will, God pays for all injustices. He'll either pay it on the person or he's paid it on his son. So you can be free to forgive, completely free to reflect God and show what he's like. This is where this prayer leads. This is why this prayer isn't a prayer for us anymore. Because we've seen what Jesus has done and we've seen what God is like. Instead, our prayer is, thank you, Jesus, for paying my sins. Help me to love people like you love me. Corrie ten Boom, when the, uh, the guard came up to her, he, the, the guard came up to shake her hand. He said, um, you mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, which was the, the concentration camp there. I was a guard there. But since that time, I've become a Christian. I know God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. And a hand came out, and he asked, will you forgive me? How can she forgive him? The guard that's killed so many people potentially killed his, her sister. Well, the reason she can, and the reason she did, is because all of his sins have been paid for. But by Jesus, justice has been done. And so he, she can forgive him, knowing her sins are paid for, knowing his sins are paid for. And as she does it, she describes this warm, this overwhelming feeling that comes into her life and this joy that she feels, it feels like it raced down her arms, springs into her hands, healing warmth that seemed to flood her whole being, bringing her to tears. She said, I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. That is what Jesus can do because he pays for our justice on the cross. One, I pray that we would reflect him and do the same sort of thing this Christmas. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done for us in Jesus, the little baby who was innocent and treated so badly, the true king of the world, who went to the cross to pay the injustice against him so that we don't have to pay it. Lord, would that fuel us to pray for our enemies? Would that fuel us to pray for those who, are, who don't like us? Would that fuel us to pray for those who are mean to us, whether they realize it or not, so that we might reflect God this Christmas time by being people who love through justice rather than merely demand it? And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.